Welcome to the Simpleton Podcast, your best source for fake news. Today, we have housekeeping listener feedback on previous episodes. Then we have sinking your boat. Um, postmodernism in the 90s versus postmodernism now. Big difference. Real change comes from a winning aesthetic. And finally, we're going to talk about some uh, interesting sitcoms, particularly Everybody Hates Chris and comparing it to Good Times from the 80s. Laura, how about we start with housekeeping? What do you? What's the listener feedback we received? Okay. Um, well, first of all, a listener uh, said she did not know who Bo Jackson was and had to look him up. And that's a scandal. <laughs> <laughs> also, a sign we're getting old. Yeah, yeah. But Bo Bo Jackson was like in in my family, like it was like cereal box dreams to get like a Bo Jackson baseball card or a Bo nose like bumper stick, uh, like a Bo nose bumper sticker. Um, and he was an amazing athlete and played professional football and baseball at the same time, um, which is really extremely unusual. And if you hear like football players talk, they kind of talk about how they go to war <laughs> for a few months of the year, you know, uh, when they're playing football and then they spend the whole entire rest of the year recovering. Um, and Bo did not do that. Bo played baseball in his off season, you know, um, also at an all-star level, he was all, at an all in he was all-star in both sports. Yes. And, um, so his big, that there was like a big Nike ad campaign that was like Bo knows, Bo knows baseball, Bo knows football, Bo knows everything. Um, and Bo referred to himself in the third person, um, which was an interesting thing about him. And I just found out that he did that because when he was a child, he had a terrible stutter and he had a hard time saying I, but in the nineties, it was like part of his like persona, you know, like Bo. <laughs> yeah. So he um, had his career cut very short. And I would say he's kind of the very first uh, real viral marketing campaign. Mm -hmm. Like, I mean, mm. Michael Jordan is after him, but yeah. it's hard to, I mean, the only person comparable to Michael Jordan's viral marketing would have been Bo, you know? Um, he was cut short because in one a professional football game, he had a hip injury that was misdiagnosed, is my understanding. And somehow blood was cut off to his hip and he had to have an artificial hip implanted because part of the bone died or something. And yeah. then he went back and did a comeback with the White Sox in baseball, but never tried football again. And the comeback wasn't that great. But before that, he was the... He was the top. He was on the Mount Everest. He, I still think he's probably one of the top athletes that ever lived. Was you he know? a royal? He was a royal. He was a royal yeah. and a Oakland Raider. Yeah. Um. He also sent his kids to Catholic school, and uh, he very, was very proud that his kids were one of the most disciplined kids in the Catholic school, even though he's not Catholic. <laughs> he brags about this that the sisters would would compliment him, and this is very proud, you know. Okay. Um, well, anyway. so um, this listener also brought up that she um, looked him up and found out that he is in the edibles business, um, which would answer, you know, uh, how uh, Bo changed his mind on his 2016 platform, which we uh, talked about. Uh, I guess couple podcasts ago. So um, we, we ran Bo for president and he was yeah. for legalize or when the drug quit or when the drug war. Yeah. And now he's actually in the drug business. That's what you're saying. Well, so um, I, I looked it up and it's not edibles. Exactly. Um, it's not like products like unless I missed it. So <laughs> tell me if I missed it, but I think he does like CBD oil products. Um, so not which, like getting high like products from marijuana, but doesn't get you high. Is that the mm -hmm. idea? Yeah. Okay. It's like, uh, usually used for like healing or pain relief or calming properties, but it doesn't have the, I think. Yeah. Um, so that's my understanding of Bo's business, but maybe I missed the edibles. Um, I just saw his CBD oil page and how they get it, you know, get the THC out of it, et cetera. So, can I do a shout out to this idea of like, like people don't actually know who Bo is like, so he's legend 
uh, for people like say in their forties would kind of know him as a legend. Yeah. Right. Um, forties and up. Right. Well, our now, listener is in her forties, but I don't think her family was. Tuned in to sports. sports, I think. Is that right? Boy, it's hard to miss <laughs> Bo Jackson, even if you weren't to. You know, she must have been like living off grid. <laughs> it's, it's a, I don't know if it's a woman. Or She's whatever, listening right? to this. Yes. She's like, great. <laughs> Congratulate. You are a very pure person for not, you know, engaging in pop culture at that level. Um, the other thing, though, was there was this guy named Jim Thorpe who's interesting that my dad used to tell me about. So his whole professional career happened before the Great Depression. Okay. Hey everyone, Ben the editor here. Clark's audio takes a little bit of a dip for the next 15 seconds or so, and then it gets a little bit better, and then it fixes itself completely later on. We had some issues with Clark's audio recording settings, and just want to give you a heads up. He was a professional football player, a professional baseball player, and an Olympian. And he was Native American. And he is Mm -hmm. just like so far beyond everyone else that apparently like uh, he went to, so there's this, Haskell University is this university in Kansas that's an only Native American university. It's run by the Bureau of Indian Affairs, right? And Jim Thorpe went there. He grew up in Oklahoma and went there. And when they would go to track meets, they would like just send him or him and one other guy. And he would do every event and he would win the meet against (laughs) other universities. Like that's how amazing he was, right? So Bo's like kind of at that level. Like Bo was known for like, uh, entering the decathlon and skipping events and still winning the decathlon. Like, because so he, he would come in last in those events that he skipped. Yeah. Yeah. He would he'd, yeah. He'd score a zero in certain events, but he'd win every single other <laughs> one. So he didn't even, he could still win yeah. the decathlon without even participating in all the events. Yeah. So that's how far beyond everyone he was. Um, all right. Feedback on Bo. What other feedback did we get? Um, okay. So there was a question about, um, well, uh, same listener was disappointed in your gun buyback. Um, she thought you left the explanation short. You said um, we don't need gun buyback programs because we have pawn shops. And um, she was waiting for more explanation on that. But she thought that uh, one of the main goals of a gun buyback program would be to take guns out of circulation and destroy them, which a pawn shop does not do, obviously. Yeah. And and she's right. I mean, I think they do usually destroy the guns they get from gun buyback. I don't think they like mm-hmm. put them on gunbroker.com or something. Yeah. But um and I do think that that observation that she has is relevant in places like Australia and Europe where they do gun buybacks and there aren't that many guns in circulation. Mm-hmm. The mm-hmm. thing to keep in perspective in the United States, which is, is going to be shocking to some people, there are more guns in the US than there are people. Mm-hmm. The estimates on guns are approach about 350 million. Yeah. On like guns in circulation in the United States. So, and these successful gun buybacks, the one that like when you look up articles of US gun buybacks, they'll be like, this weekend we took 2,000 guns off, you know, for mm-hmm. an average price of like 300 bucks or something, right? To dent the US gun supply, you'd have to like say you wanted to dent it by 10%. I mean, you're looking at, over 30 million guns at 300 bucks a piece. I mean, you're talking the amount of money you're talking about is yeah. astronomical. And even then probably all you did was make guns more valuable. Yeah. You know, I bet, I yeah. bet at the same time you're trying to buy back that many, you're driving up the price of what you're trying to buy back. Yeah. I, I wonder if like, um, like eliminating, Guns, like, I mean, you would want to eliminate guns more heavily in areas where there's a lot of gun violence. You know, like, you don't need to do gun buybacks in every part of the country. My my sense was you're trying to get a certain type of gun out of circulation. Mm -hmm. And it's not about it being an assault weapon or an mm-hmm. automatic weapon or anything like that. What you're trying to get out of circulation is like guns an uncared that, for gun <laughs> An uncared for, I called them orphan yeah. guns, you know, like the gun mm-hmm. that's in the drawer that, you know, uncle had, but uncle's in prison or something. Yeah. Or you're trying to get guns out of the hands of criminals or something like that. So, um, and it could be a revolver. Or it could be like some military weapon either way. Um, I don't know how you really do that. I mean, I do feel like anyone who goes to the gun buyback program, as opposed to the pawn shop, really didn't want the gun to begin with. Yeah. So it's kind of like, sure. You know, I could see like grandma looking at, you know, wayward son or wayward grandkid and being like, look, we don't have money for food next week. 
right. go send your gun down there and get me 300 bucks at the grocery yeah. store. You know, yeah. like I could see that creating a dynamic uh, that would be helpful. You know, like anybody who's like a responsible gun owner, that's just not even a temptation. Yeah, that's not right. Right. Yeah. yeah. So um, anyway, all right. I, yeah, the conclusion on that episode was gun buybacks aren't really that important because pawn shops are doing it every day. Therefore, like, why do we do this? Um, yeah. I, it could be of limited use, I think. So, yeah. So you you weren't necessarily trying to take reduce the number of guns. You were trying you're more reduce the number of uh, orphan guns. Right. And which I really yeah. think reducing the number of guns in the U.S. Uh, is not plausible. Mm hmm. Right? Yeah. And it, yeah, it would be so draconian what you would have to do to get guns out of the U.S. that you'd be destroying the U.S. while you did it. Yeah. You know, either financially or just like conflict, mm -hmm. you know, so yeah. I'm not not really for that, regardless of what you think of guns, you know. All right. I got a piece of feedback from your last podcast that you did with Mary and oh, Ryan. Okay. All right. right. Mm -hmm. uh, quote from Pope Benedict. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's from Introduction to Christianity. I think it's from the Introduction of the Introduction to Christianity. Oh. Which, by the way, is one of the greatest books ever. And if it you ever is such do an a amazing book. Club, yeah. Yes. <laughs> um, written long before he was Pope, you know, written, yeah. I think, in the 70s. But it's just, mm -hmm. it's such a striking book. But in the introduction, it says you cannot baptize Marxism. Which is just interesting. Listen to our last episode for... <laughs> yes, deep dive in there. Yeah. All right. Another th last piece of housekeeping. Um, there's been this finding that's come out that uh, male Testo testosterone in young men has decreased by about 50% in the last 25 years. I don't actually have the citation for this, which I should get. But have you heard of this finding, Laura? Mm hmm. So the move now is I go to the young men at Simple House and I go, Have you heard of this finding? And they have. And they're like, Yes, we have. And I, they're alarmed. And I go, well, I want to know, what's that feel like? <laughs> All right. You come to me here for old man flexes. That's what you do if you're an old man. You, the other thing you do is you hold your hand out like for a fist bump. And then when they come to fist bump you, you just fist bump yourself like you're making a little like connection. It, yeah, it kind of breaks their heart. Puts them in the right place. <laughs> They're more available for God by the time I'm done with them. But <laughs> all right. Sorry. Uh, now you know that my sense of humor is not very healthy. All right. <laughs> OK, moving away from housekeeping. Laura, how about you introduce this topic? All right. Uh, sinking your boat. Um, someone um, sent me a video. Um, it was like an interview with Victor Davis Hanson, who I guess is a historian and a writer, amongst other things. And um, he was talking about the middle class and he made this observation. Um, he was saying like the left has always operated um, um, as if they are like this, like critical. Uh, intellectual uh, force that needed to like poke holes in the system, um, but that they've been doing this, assuming that the system is always there. And um, the larger point he was trying to make is um that uh they or we or <laughs> the way we're operating right now we're really actually like gutting the systems so it's like we're we're poking so many holes in the military that like the military recruiting is like hugely down like he said like a couple years ago it was like 45 percent down um and he gave some other examples you know during covid we saw some manufacturing holes. So he's he's saying that right now that the left is like kind of taking shots at the middle class, calling them fascists and deplorable and irredeemable and the dregs of society, et cetera, et cetera. But we're assuming that we're still going to have people to fight our wars, to clean our windows, to fix our cars, et cetera. Um, and uh, he thinks that this is like not as true as we're assuming that it is. <laughs> um, right. And so. I guess like the the idea is you can like poke so many holes in your ship that you like sink it. Right. And um, the thing that I started thinking about after listening to this is like 
with religion or the family or whatever, like we've like gutted a lot of things in our country. And it's like, if you like, we've gutted religion, we've kind of taken the meaning out of it. Uh, think you're kind of backwards if you're religious or whatever, but we're still expecting people to like act as if they have like meaning and purpose and belonging and accountability and morals and all those things that typically come with religion. Um, and yeah, so I don't know. I, I thought that was an interesting idea. It's like that you can destroy something so much that you gut it um, without realizing maybe, but you're still assuming that you have like the positive uh, things of, you know, um, be it the military, the family, religion. Yeah, it seems true about many things, right? Yeah. So if something is like powerfully entrenched as the establishment, and mm -hmm. then you have this small kind of like left critique of mm -hmm. either sexism or whatever they're critiquing about the establishment, you know, uh, that that seems like it could be a useful critique, right? Like you cut and it's kind of also brave. It's kind of like punching up in a sense. Um, it's yeah, kind of like it, it's a little bit, um, it's a little bit of like the checks and balances we expect in our country, you know? <laughs> right. Um, and you could even attack the family to a certain extent and say, look, not all these families are quite as nice as they seem. There's mm -hmm. spousal abuse, there's child abuse, there's these things that need corrected, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, and, but as you go from being like a small minority critiquing an establishment, and I feel like this is the ethos of what the left kind of like idealizes as like the 1960s, like, you know, like courageous critique, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. Uh, but then when you become the establishment, you're no longer like punching up, you're punching down on the yeah. family and things like this. Right. And you actually can beat them to the point or poke holes in them to point that they actually just don't function. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That seems, um, bad. gosh, I, it's so, in the thing that bothers me about this is I remember like being alive, you know, in the nineties and eighties when people would be like, they're attacking the family. And I'd be like, Oh, don't exaggerate. Yeah. You know? And now it feels like, Oh yeah, they they've not only attacked the family, they've almost de-justified it in most people's minds. They think of it's like one of many you yeah. know, plausible ways you could live your life is to have a family and it's like actually it's probably the most natural way to become happy. Yeah. Yeah, right. Yes. And and, and like all the research supports that. Right. <laughs> um yeah. Um and it, it's interesting because I I feel like um people that um want to um just let it all burn, you know, and aren't coming with solutions necessarily. They're just like, this is bad, destroy, you know? And it's like, well, what are you leaving? I do think sometimes people are trying to bring these solutions that are like artificial, um, like kind of m develop like a civic ethic or something that it's, it's like not the same as a religion that you believe in with your whole heart, you know, or, um, or, uh, I think that people that think that the nuclear family is, you know, a vehicle for white supremacy or whatever. <laughs> um, I actually think you're, I actually think you're right that like, like one of the things that really bothered me, I felt like I'd been saying black lives matter long before there was a black lives matter movement. Mm -hmm. I've been like, why aren't we taking these schools as seriously as these other schools? Or why aren't we taking the crime here as seriously as the crime there? Which is yes. basically a black lives matter argument. It's like why in the mm -hmm. black community are we excusing this level of education when this would never fly over in the burbs? Right. Yeah. But then when the black lives movement actually hits the scene, you see a critic with no solutions. Yes. Yeah. And it f upset me so bad because it was like, look, if someone would just like they could have raised money for a solution with no problem. They could have gone to like the city. They raise a whole lot of money. They raise a whole lot of money without a solution. They raise yeah. a whole lot of money with a, merely a criticism. Right. Yeah. But like if they would have said, hey, look, here's our 15 best thinkers. We're going to partner with this major city. I always think it would be Baltimore. <laughs> We're going to fund it with one hundred million dollars. These major thinkers get to reform all police training the whole police disciplinary process, police hiring. Um, and we're just going to try it in Baltimore. And when you see how good it is at the end, all the major cities will want to do this. Yeah. Right. You could have just done that and not even had to have Baltimore pay for it. You know, yeah. I mean, there was so much yeah. interest in doing yeah. that, you know, yes. but they never wanted to propose anything. Yeah. You know? It was like make things better or burn it down was kind right. of the two ideas or just turn over the keys to someone who has no stated plan. You know? Yeah. Which, it makes you think it's either the desire for destruction or the des or a power grab. 
Or both. Yeah. Or both, right. Or, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Or one one helping the other. Yeah. And I think uh, I was talking to a friend who is a vice principal and uh, she was saying that like, um, it's like if, if some of her staff is going to bring forward a complaint, she wants them to come with like a few suggestions on how to solve the problem, you know? Um, and I don't think she means like idealistic ways about this is what, how it should be, you know? <laughs> right. Not utopian um, dreams, yeah, but, right. but real but solutions. Like, yeah. Um, I think that's so, right. And I, I think that's, yeah. And I, I think that's, it's like, um, I, I mean, in any aspect of life, it's very frustrating when you have someone poking holes in like, you're trying to bring forth an idea, you know? Do you remember though, like when this was going on, like either I had this online conversation in the comments section of different, like, you know, posts, um, it was kind of like this idea of like, um, sure, you're right in your critique, or I could grant give you, you know, this critique, but like, what's the solution, you know? Yeah. And then the, the response was, it was like, as if it was like the practiced response was, it's not my job to solve the problem. That's your job. Yeah. You know, it's like, it was like part of their anger was that you weren't going to fix it too. Which is just I, so weird. Yeah. Well, it was weird because at the same time, it was like, it's your job to fix it, but you also don't actually understand the problem because you can't. <laughs> right. Yeah. 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 I, it, it, yeah. Um, well, let's, let's um, transition here. Cause I think this has a lot to do with this next point. So yeah. we, at simple house, we just read Fidea's at ratio, right? It's an encyclical from the nineties. It's a beautiful encyclical. Um, the main points that most people would take now is it does a really good job of defining uh, the role of philosophy, the role of theology and the role of um, like a, a Christian philosopher, mm -hmm. but it says, it literally just says there's no such thing as Christian philosophy. There's no officially baptized philosophy, right? Yeah. Um, but the other thing it does in the beginning, which is why I think it hit home so well in the 90s and he helped me so much, was it did a really good job of surfing this idea that all religions are correct. It kind of said that, um, which is kind of this postmodern, like everyone's right. Everyone's right. You know, in fact, they're all just kind of just different approaches to exactly the same thing, you know, and in this encyclical, JP two's kind of makes a statement like, hey, look, to the extent that anyone's authentically asking what's the meaning of life and how to live, these are good questions. These are useful endeavors in every culture. Mm -hmm. um, you can learn from them. We as Catholics can even learn from them. But no, it's not all equally right. You know, we do believe that Christ is the center, et cetera. So mm -hmm. it was kind of both like honoring that they have a point, but no, they're yeah. way, they're, they're mistaken if they think that there either is no truth or that all the truth is the same, you know, yeah. in all these religions. So what was interesting in this discussion we had was that little passage doesn't hit home for like the young new missionaries anymore. Yeah. Um, it doesn't like the way it hit me when I read this in, you know, either the early two thousands, I think I read it, uh, it hit me really well. Like I was like, Oh yes. The capstone is the longer we discuss the, the more modern attitude, we realize that I think this ex will explain a lot, but in the nineties, it was like, truth is relative and everyone's right. <laughs> and now they no longer think everyone's right. But saying everyone's right is kind of the same way as saying everyone's wrong. Right, right. But the way we lived it and felt it was like everyone's right very optimistically. Yeah. Right? Now it's felt like everyone's wrong very negatively. Yes. Yeah. Um, when we've uh, discussed like different topics with the volunteers in the past like couple years, I've like all of a sudden realized like I have to explain to the volunteers like no <laughs> you don't understand in the 90s like we thought like everything was getting better and the whole bright future was like opening up and becoming better and better you know when we were all hopeful and thought our recycling was really making a difference and like but there was just and like that the future was whatever we hoped it could be you know and that was just like in, in the air, you know, and the JP two generation of which I think you and mm -hmm. I are kind of part mm -hmm. of, it was this attitude of like, well, there's this, they just don't understand. Like as soon as we like explain, you know, the real perspective of the Catholic church, either as like, you know, uh, youth ministers or theology teachers in high schools or to the New York times reporter, if they actually got what we're saying, they'd be for us. It's, it's a communication yeah. problem. Right, right. Right. It's not that we're hated or that we're yeah. being sabotaged or anything yeah. like that. 
And I think like if you think, oh, well, what about Gen X and the grunge people or whatever? Like they weren't all happy, happy. But I I think there was like a real belief, like, you know, like we're going to save the trees. (laughs) I don't know. I, I, I think people thought that their actions mattered and it wasn't like I. Yeah, I don't know. I I think. I think you're right, and I think this observation is very general that other people have made in a way that, like, the 90s is the end of the Cold War. The, the mm-hmm. You know, the feeling of imminent nuclear war has been lifted. The Berlin Wall has fallen. Yeah. Uh, we are the victors. It is our way that is the future. All that is optimism, right? What yeah. I found interesting about this observation that's different, I think, is that it was like, not only that truth is relative in a way that everything's true. And now it feels like truth is relative in a way that everything is false. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Like all of these religions are irrelevant in some way because they just don't actually help your life. Yeah. Right. And this is nihilism. This is like going from like this optimistic postmodernism to this nihilistic attitude. Right. And if that attitude is merely sadness, it's tragic. Yeah. Right. The problem is, is that it doesn't remain sadness. It goes from sadness to anger you know, an anger to murder. And I don't just mean school shootings. I mean, like, that's kind of why I believe these critiques of our situation want to tear everything down and see everything burn in a riot is because it's this nihilistic anger where they don't think there is a solution. Yeah. And so you might as well burn it down and destroy. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. And in that situation... um. You know, like we were talking that like if if in the 90s you said Catholicism was uniquely true, it was, was like rude. you were saying something rude. You were, you were yeah. kind of insulting the truth of all these other things. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And now if you say Catholicism is like the truth and uniquely true, it's like you're saving something out of this nihilistic rejection and, and in an edgy punk rock way, bringing it back and saying, actually, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> this, you know, interesting retro thing is actually yeah. You know, the spark that is true. Well, I think in the 90s, it seemed like rude and backwards. And now it's kind of like barely anchored and a surprising idea. <laughs> you know, well, like, well, now yeah. I feel like it's what straight edge used to be. It's yeah. like hardcore. Yeah. You know, to bring yeah. something back and actually live by yeah. it and try it, you know. Mm-hmm. And this kind of goes into another thing to the next point, which is the winning aesthetic idea. All right. So the idea of the winning aesthetic is... That real change does not happen by, like, forcing change, by, like, overturning Roe v. Wade. The real change happens when you kind of win hearts and minds. Mm -hmm. And the way you win hearts and minds is maybe not the most Christian way in the world. The way you win hearts and minds is by, like, throwing the parties people want to be at. (laughs) (laughs) Being cool. Like, aspirationally cool where people want to associate with you. And I feel like, historically... Uh, the progressive causes have had this, right? Mm -hmm. Oh, you're so idealistic or look how courageous you are. Look how brave you are to attack these structures, right? And now it's like the structures are dying and it's like no longer brave to go attack them. It's actually very, um, yeah. What do you call it? Passe or. Yeah. Um, It's weak. (laughs) (laughs) Um, And I think this winning aesthetic idea is kind of like, I think the Latin mass has had a moment in the last couple of years. I feel like that wave is already like receding where it was like kind of like an edgy, cool thing people wanted to be associated with, Mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. And same with a lot of traditionalism. And you'll even see these like kind of YouTube or there's these whole like little industries of influencers who are just saying really like basic things about, um, the sexes about reality, about morality, and they're saying it almost as an edgy affront to postmodernism, yeah. right? Yeah. And so the winning aesthetic idea would be this: it's like in the eighty in the eighties, um, there was Andy Warhol, right? And he had this. By the way, he was a Daily Mass Catholic. I have no idea what his real spiritual life is. I'm still waiting for the read a book on that. I want to read a book where it's Andy Warhol, Salvador Dali, oh, and um, Oscar Wilde. Mm. You know, and talking about those three wild men's Catholicism, you know, almost surely they're all a little bit crazy, you know, or maybe more than a little bit. But like when you look at like uh, Salvador Dali 
like Last Supper is probably the greatest Last Supper of the last couple of centuries. Yeah. You know, it's, it's in D.C. Um, at the National Gallery, but it's amazing, you know, mm-hmm. um, and it's the most asked about painting in the whole National Gallery. Like People come there and ask, where's the Last Supper by Salvador Dali? Mm-hmm. And they have historically had it in the stairwell. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so Andy Warhol was so cool. And he had this place called the Factory in New York City where the Velvet Underground would play. It was like his party place, right? Like if you knew someone who went there, you were cooler for knowing someone who went there. If you could go there once, you were cool. If you could go there as a regular, you were even cooler. If you somehow went to the second floor or third floor, wherever the inner circle was, you were the coolest, right? Mm -hmm. It was like an aspirational scene that was like the winning aesthetic, right? Yeah. I don't know that Christianity can ever be that. No. We're never going to be the in crowd because we can't be because somehow it's not that love that is Christ. Yeah. There's this like I, I I just read this in like um both Pope Benedict and Thomas Dubé recently like it's like people's hearts are gonna be changed by seeing like kind of happy Christ filled families you know and I think that's true but on some days <laughs> people are gonna see the messy chaotic maybe momentarily unhappy family and it's not going to be winning every time. (laughs) Yeah. And I think it's like trying to like fabricate it actually makes kills the thing. I think you're right. I I feel like though the family wins in this different way, like this, like Pope, um, not Pope, uh, Bishop Johnston in our interview with him said that the domestic church is like an evangelization place. Yes. Yeah. And I think what it is, is like when you've been around people being fake, when you've been around this, like, like inner circle type crowd and you start realizing that they're not happy. Right. Yeah. And then you walk into a healthy family or yeah. a healthy parish. You're kind of taken aback. You're taken aback by the authenticity, by the realness, by the naturalness, by the Holy spirit working within realness and naturalness, you know? Yeah. And even the like little problems, the healthy family has like the messy house and things like this can be very evangelical. You know, yeah. people are just naturally thinking, I would rather be around this right. than around this more fake culture that I've been in. Yeah. Right. But I don't think that's a winning aesthetic. It wins right. people for Christ. Like when I think of every Simple House event we ever tried to thing, my goal mm-hmm. is to create the feel of a family reunion. Yeah. And yeah. that's not the Andy Warhol or the Kurt Cobain or the <laughs> like aspirational yeah. cool feel, you know? Yeah. Yeah. It's almost like quit trying so hard and just be loved feel. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You just can't like worry about the, the veneer of it. Cause you'll kill it by, by doing that. And, um, people will see it or not see it. I don't know, but I, I was, I just watched a video about, uh, like the Jonestown suicide, like the Kool-Aid, you know, mass suicide. And it was uh, this senator went down to like visit Jonestown because there were like these complaints had been coming in and um, they put on this big party where everybody was singing and dancing and happy and laughing and all that, you know. And he was like, well, this place seems great, you know. Um, And he was there for like a multi-day stay. And it was like towards the end of his visit, people started slipping him notes like get us out of here, you know, but it was interesting because they like manufactured this like happy thing and it, yeah, that's, that's the aesthetic can be fake. Right. Can you do two yeah. things there? I think we mm-hmm. might've just made the same mistake. How not everyone who listens knows who Bo Jackson is. Can you recap the Jones? I think, but also what did that Senator do with all those notes? Oh, okay. <laughs> um, okay. So I, I'm blanking on the name, but there was like a cult, um, in San Francisco in California. Um, and it was run by this very charismatic guy, Jim Jones. And he had kind of like the secrets, you know, and he had everyone living in community, um, and, uh, was kind of creating this, you know, vibe of like the world is evil and, you know, everyone's going to hell and, So let's kind of, you know, circle the wagons in our little community here. And he kind of had the secrets, you know, and um, he eventually moved like the whole community down to Guyana in South America. And they were like in the middle of the rainforest. And it was like, basically, it was like physically very dangerous to leave. 
<laughs> the compound um, because you could like get eaten by a wild cat or something, you know, in the rainforest. But he would do all these kind of like crazy mental games to get like, you know, this kind of extreme obedience and um, people uh, um, buying in um, and uh, kind of suppressing dissidents, you know, and um if you ever have heard the expression like drinking the Kool-Aid, this is where it comes from. And so he would have this thing where he would like make he would like pick members, you know, and say, um, I need you to drink this Kool-Aid, you know, to show your loyalty to me and to the community and whatever. And it could be poisoned. It could be not, you know. Um, and so they would like do this. And if people stepped out of line, there was like very like harsh punishment. So whatever. So it was like a cult and it was nuts. Um, but all this time they had been stockpiling all this like cyanide and, um, because there might be a time like when mass suicide was necessary because the world was like so evil and crazy and it would be better to die than. And I think not all of the members of the community knew that like it was kind of like a top tier. So the Senator goes down and um to investigate because people are like hey my family is in this cult and like they're americans and can we get them out and so he goes and he sees this like great happy show where everyone like loves it so much and he starts getting these notes and he's like okay well i'm leaving in three days i have two planes like um only like i don't know like 20 to 30 people were like brave enough to say they were gonna leave you know and um there's there's like video of Jim Jones like talking to them and he's like obviously upset but says okay. So they all get like trucked out to these trucks, you know, um and by, uh, to these two planes that are going to leave to go to the US and as they're boarding the plane these guys like come from the compound and start shooting everyone including the senator what? was killed. I yeah. didn't know about that. Yeah. I just know about the Kool Aid thing. Oh my right. goodness! Right. So, so then, so then, while everyone's like getting shot up, uh, that's getting on the plane, there were like some survivors. Um, they're like preparing the Kool Aid, and they're actually putting cyanide in it this time, and they make everyone drink it, and the kids, and they made the kids drink it first. Um, and uh, yeah. Um, so like nine hundred and some people died either mostly by like cyanide poisoning some by gunshot uh because they it was like it seemed like some people were drinking willingly but a lot of them were drinking it at gunpoint anyway it was a very dark <laughs> horrible thing but uh so this is this this is um where the expression like drinking the kool-aid comes from yeah, so yeah. drinking the Kool-Aid kind of means you're a true believer willing to die for the yeah, cause, you're like but buying, you've also you're lost buying your the rationality. Lie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's yeah. dark. That's that darker than I thought that was. Aside. Even I knew it was mass suicide, which is already dark, but yeah. wow. Wait, yeah. 900 people, is that's like crazy. That is. That's like so many people. Um, yeah. Wow. Yeah. All right, and that's the end of the podcast. Thank you for uh, listening. Stop. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, we got one more topic. All right. Well, shoot, that was that was heavy. Um, let's talk about. Uh, now we're kind of switching. Everything so far kind of followed each other. Uh, yeah. Let's talk about these two sitcoms. Okay, so I've been watching. Everybody loves Chris. I know I'm late. To Everybody the party. hates Chris. Everybody hates Chris. Yeah, yeah, that's the whole point. People love Raymond, but they hate Chris. And I, you know, coming the age I am, raised to be kind of race blind, the symbol, meaning like don't make policies ever based on race, uh, make them like race blind, right? And don't judge people on race, be race blind. Um, the Black Lives Matter movement is kind of the opposite of that. It's kind of like saying, no, you know, this race is worse or better than that, you know, et cetera, right? Or this race has guilt, this race doesn't, et cetera. There's a controversial Coleman Hughes TED talk about race blindness right now. So you oh, can that's go great. look at that. Coleman yeah. Hughes <laughs> is an interesting young guy, young guy, meaning like he's early twenties, uh, went to Columbia and very controversial thinker in race. He's a black guy. Mm -hmm. And, um, it, did his TED talk get banned for promoting race? Blindness? It was, uh, he claims that it was suppressed, even though it was eventually released. They wanted to release it with a debate because people at TED were, offended by 
his view, which is your view that you just right. expressed. Yeah, saying <laughs> saying that you do not want race to be considered when judging individuals yeah. or making rules is now an offensive statement. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and yeah, anyway, you can just watch okay. his thing. And- the, the other reason why I like, I think race blindness is important is because of evangelization. Ultimately, evangelization is about the common human problem, the common human mm-hmm. situation and solution and all that. And the more you create um, differences between humans, the harder it is to evangelize. Yeah. Like if you say, this type of human's like this, this type of human's like this, then it's much harder to go in there and say, hey, look, our commonality is what makes, yeah. is, is where evangelization comes from. And Christ is addressing this common problem, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so everybody hates Chris. So watching episodes, the chorus is always everybody hates Chris. <laughs> so <laughs> it's a painful thing to watch. It's dark humor, right? But like the worst episode was Christmas and Chris really wants this thing for Christmas to Sony Walkman in the eighties and his family's poor and he's in Brooklyn, you know? And, uh, they get to the point where uh, the water heater goes out before Christmas and now they're going to use the money that was going to go to his Sony Walkman for the water heater. And so they sit him down and say, hey, son, you know, you know, the family needs this water heater. You can't have a Christmas present. And then he's like, OK, well, I understand there's no presents for Christmas. They're like, oh, no, no, no. The other kids are going to get presents because we they already, already bought got- them <laughs> and they're younger than you. So you are now grown up at like 11 or 10 and you're going to have to go to Christmas without a present. Right. <laughs> And there is no way that, like, Friends or any other sitcom would have taken that kid to Christmas. They went to Christmas. Full house, sir. Yeah. Yeah. You keep like- <laughs> waiting for, like, the saving grace to come in and him to get the Christmas present that's, like, better than ever. And you resolve the tension. Yeah. They don't. They go to Christmas. He receives nothing. And he becomes a man at, like, 10. <laughs> to help the little kids celebrate their Christmas and he gets nothing. All right. And this was like, I couldn't watch it. (laughs) Right. It's just like too difficult to watch this 10 year old actor, like just sit there at Christmas. Right. And maybe that's because I run a ministry. I loved giving, making sure kids got something for Christmas. But, Mm -hmm. um, then I started thinking about how I don't know any other show that would have done that. Then I started thinking about the old TV show, good times. Mm-hmm. And I started realizing that as back in when I was a child, there were only four channels and we all had to watch everything because there was only 10 shows on four channels. So we all watched Love Boat. <laughs> we all watched Gilligan's Island. We all watched Good Times. We all watched these things. And uh, I started realizing that the whole point of Good Times was this point. You know, and I think it yeah. where, would you uh, what is the uh, can you do the um, lyrics of the Good Times theme song? Let me find it. Let me and if you can it. sing it, that'd be even better. I can't actually. <laughs> it, the thing, if you if you don't remember it, or you're too young to remember it, that, that it went sound like maybe or maybe Ben could play it for everybody right now. All right, if you don't play it, Ben, here's my rendition. Obviously, just played a little snippet, but Clark's rendition is great, so I'm leaving this in. Stay tuned to the end of the episode for a even fuller rendition from Clark. Good times every time you need a. P- I can't remember the next line. All right. Well, it's, it's good times anytime style. you need. Anytime you meet a payment, good times. Anytime you need a friend, good times. Anytime you're out from under, not getting hassled, not getting hustled, keeping your head above water, making a wave when you can. Temporary layoffs, good times. Easy credit ripoffs, good times. Scratching and surviving, good times. Hanging in and jiving, good times. Uh, ain't we lucky we got them? Good times. Yeah. Okay. So in each episode, like the dad would get laid off, um, a kid would get beat up, you know what I mean? Some would become addicted to drugs and it was a comedy. (laughs) Do you know what I mean? Like, and it was a comedy, right? (laughs) And, uh, this is the famous comedy where we'd be like, dynamite. That was like, this is, that's good times, right? Mm -hmm. And it's like, they're never resolving the fundamental issue. But they're a family and they're having joy and they're having comedy despite all the stuff that is just wrong. Yeah. Right. And that's kind of like the everybody hates Chris idea also. 
there's a lot of stuff that's wrong that you're they're not going to be able to fix, mm-hmm. but they're going to have joy and comedy in the midst of it, mm-hmm. right? And I think this is like this deep. This this is unsettling to me because I think in the white community we don't have this very much. Like we yeah. like I want to watch someone fundamentally fix their problem and then have good times. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Like go get the good job, go move to a safer neighborhood and then have good times. Don't just like accept that you can't do those things and not have good times. You know, and then have good times anyway, right? Um I think this idea is that Christianity is that which helps us flourish and um, gives us fullness of life and happiness in the good times. And it's also that which helps us flourish and have fullness of life and happiness in the persecution, Mm -hmm. you know, or in the worst times. And I think that's like a reality of Christianity that we somehow need to accept, need to talk about more. Yeah. I mean, I I think this is just like also taps into, I, I think all of the missionaries at a simple house had been really like, edified uh when families that we help who are poor like do something generous for us or for their neighbors or um and there's like a something that's like more fundamental than your situation you know um and it's i i think it's if you are coming from a place of stability or comfort (laughs) you're like why are you doing this you know (laughs) um but it's it's actually there's something um, good about it, you know. Many years ago, there was a family that didn't have running water. Their water bill had not been paid. Mm-hmm. And we were bringing them things like water. And uh, it was becoming Christmas time, and they had somehow gotten a Christmas tree. Mm-hmm. But they didn't, I don't, they didn't have any presents to put under it, and they also didn't have any um, ornaments, right? Mm-hmm. And so the kids and maybe the parents had written letters put them in envelopes and sealed them and put the letters all in the Christmas tree. And they called them the letters of Christmas. And they acted like that was the most normal, awesome thing you could ever do was have the letters of Christmas. Yeah. And it was very kind of like, wow, you know, yeah. and, and yeah. Like also like, like I need to have that type of attitude too. You know what yeah. I mean? And I've also seen like some parishes go through ups and downs. Like when your parish is like, growing and getting new families or you have a dynamic priest or the fundraising is going well, there's a certain like kind of feeling in the parish. Yeah. And then there's also the feeling in the parish where it's like, there's people leaving. Uh, it feels like the energy has gone and there's people there kind of holding down the fort and making sure it doesn't close. Yeah. You know? And yeah. I feel like lately I've seen this transition, meaning like, like the parish that was doing great, it's now doing poorly, the poorest is doing poorly, is doing great, et cetera, et cetera. Mm-hmm. Right. And it's kind of like, we need to somehow like orient ourselves where we're the parishioner that's happy to be at that parish in the time of persecution. And we're happy to be at that parish when the the good time and we're happy in the middle, you know, and when we have the great priest or the, or the mediocre priest and we, we accept good from God. Should we not accept evil? Right. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. And that that's the life of the church that you're given at that moment. Yeah. And you're meant to flourish there. Yeah. You know, you're not meant to just like, be mad or wish it was the other way or complain. You're actually meant to like really flourish Mm -hmm. in the moment Mm -hmm. in the church you're in right now, despite it being good or bad. And I actually find that for a lot of people who are like simple house people, like our missionaries and maybe myself is sometimes easier to flourish when you're in persecution than when you're on top. Like you rise to the challenge. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. When things are yeah. actually working well and tons of people are coming to the event and all that stuff and it feels very holy or very good. And you start wondering, what am I doing? And it's like, well, what you're doing is actually what you were trying to do. <laughs> yeah. You're actually having success. You know, yeah. it takes a talent to be well. Yeah. Yeah. The, maybe we've talked about this, like a kind of way you can get into a spiritual funk is to be like living for the future or saying like, Oh, when this external situation is better, then I'll be like, really, you know, (laughs) um, whatever, you know, like when my job situation or when this or that, then like, I'll be happy. I'll be stress-free. I'll be whatever, you know? Um, and that's like a good way to get into a funk, I think. (laughs) Right. Um, and yeah. that's kind of the lesson of that TV show, Good Times. Mm-hmm. You know, like they were kind of a beautiful family or supposed to be mm-hmm. kind of modeling family mm-hmm. in bad times. Yeah. You know? Yeah. 
Yeah. Um, anyway, difficult for me to watch still today. I, I have a hard time watching that show. Good times um, or everybody hates Chris? Everybody <laughs> hates Chris. I can watch more easily, but like I said, I had to turn away, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Can we talk about our favorite thing to critique? Uh, friends. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, so in friends there, it's like all the worldly problems are kind of taken care of. And then you're just left with like rom-com. Yeah. Or yeah. Like the problems of Interpersonal, you know, luxury. Yeah. yeah. Right. Uh, some misunderstandings between friends, you know, um, it's such a weird, like description of reality, but I feel like it has like taken hold. Like when I go, I've, I've been to some places lately where, you're looking at this society that's like cool. It's fun. Like you're in this area that's just cool. It's like the restaurants are cool. The mm-hmm. bike shop is cool. The mm-hmm. way they're doing the frozen whatever on the corner is cool. Uh, the people coming down the street are cool, right? And it's almost always very expensive. Yeah. And you're also like, I I can't really argue that this isn't creative. I can't really argue that there isn't something like kind of neat about what's happening here but you're also looking at all these people working in all these stores and you're like what are they doing what is their Mm -hmm. life because like i know that me being here is like a treat right like i couldn't eat here every day i couldn't like pay these prices regularly and i know that i'm more well off than a lot of the people working retail here yeah right uh and that they're somehow both living this and participating in this, but they're participating in it kind of like by living with a bunch of single people in an apartment, Mm -hmm. you know, and not building a life and not creating a family. And it's, it's, it's this interesting thing where they've kind of like bought into friends. Yeah. You know, I, I, I wonder if a little bit that, uh, scene kind of arose a little bit in a time when it was like, well, you can kind of spend your early twenties, having a little bit of fun and figuring out really what your interest is and what path you want to pursue. But, (laughs) um, I mean, I think the complaint is that people there don't feel like there is actually now a way to like grow out of that, you know? Um, Right. So if you like were a bartender for three, four years in your twenties, uh, that's maybe like something you could do, still have a family, still buy a house, stuff like this. Right. But if you're, Mm pointing at this kind of like area as like what the good life is and what the cool street is and what the cool shops are. You can't go from working in that to that, you know, cause the property yeah. values have run away from you. Right. The, right, right. Um, the way you're think people should live is too expensive to ever save, you yeah. know? Um, and there's not really a value on family. Yeah. And the next right. generation and those things. You know? Yeah. But anyway, I've kind of gotten to the point where that's how I kind of judge in a uh, community, you know, like how are the people who make this community run? What is available to them? Not like how yeah. cool it is or how good the food is or how neat the shops are, but like the people in this community who work in this community, can they live in this community or do they have to like live friends lifestyle or commute in from two hours away? Yeah, I think, right. Or yeah, yeah I think, the commuting in is a common, <laughs> um, right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. All right. Okay. Everybody knows Bo and Bo knows. Bo knows. Fide is at Rat Show is a good read. That's my recommendation for the week. And good to see you, Laura. Like, subscribe, and send us comments. All right. See you, Clark. Peace out. credit ripoffs good times and we're lucky we got them okay good times i always kind of wanted to be a lead singer in a band